In 1988, attorney Mark Edel did something that no one had ever done before. He got a jury verdict against a tobacco company for causing the lung cancer that killed his client, Rose Cipollone. That famous case is Cipollone versus Liggett Group. And here to discuss it is attorney Mark Edel. Mark, welcome. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Good morning to you also. Well, tell us, first of all, tell me a little bit about your background, and then I'd like to hear about your initial interactions with Rose and uh, Anthony, okay. Antonio Cipolo. All right. Um, grew up in West Orange, New Jersey. Um, at the age of 13, my parents and uh, the public schools decided the best place for me would be New York Military Academy. Ironically, that's where our former President Trump went to school. Um, Went to high school at New York Military Academy, uh, went to uh, undergraduate at Boston University, and went to New York Law School, where I graduated in 1975, and clerked for a judge for a year. And then I went into private practice with the law firm Porzio Brombrig and Newman in Morristown, New Jersey. All right. And what sort of work were you doing? Trial work, I presume. Yeah, I w that's what I wanted to do. I mean, when I was in law school, I worked for the Legal Aid Society Criminal Division in Manhattan. And I really, I was a 60s kind of guy and I wanted to change things that I perceived to be wrong. And um, it was a great experience. I met a lot of interesting people. And uh, after my second year in law school, I was able to try cases in Manhattan Criminal Court. And that, that is a baptism by fire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome. It was, it was a very, very, it was a, a lot of responsibility for a, a second year law student. Let's put it that way. Interesting. Well, tell us about the Cipollones. How did you? Okay. Um, when I was, I, I, I've done plaintiffs and defense work my whole life. And at that time, most of the work that the Porzio, Bromberg, and Newman firm had um, was defense work, medical malpractice, products liability, all the plaintiff's work, pretty much Mike Bromberg handled with, and then he delegated it to me. So I had this sort of, you know, different practice than most defense lawyers and most plaintiff's lawyers. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think in the long run, it's really helped me a lot. I understand how corporations work. I understand where documents are. I understand what they do. And um, it helped me in my plaintiff's work. And conversely, when I'm, if I was defending a case, I understood where the soft underbelly is of the plaintiff's case was. So it was a, it was a very good experience. Uh, because I was so involved in products liability law and I was specializing in medical malpractice and occupational lung disease, I became very familiar with causes of cancer, lung cancer, obstructive lung disease, restrictive lung disease. And I just, I said to myself, why is it that no one's ever succeeded in the early years? There was, there were a slew of cases back in the fifties and they were just, they were just all lost. No one ever really got out of that box. The only famous person that ever brought a case early was Melvin Belli. He didn't win that case either. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, I asked him the senior partner at lunch one day. I said, look, Mike, I think, hear me out. I'd like to pursue a case against the tobacco industry. And he looked at me strangely. I said, you know, products liability law in New Jersey was at the time fairly unique. Under product liability law, we had what we call a risk utility analysis. So if a, product, if a product's risks or benefits outweighed the risks, you could still market a dangerous, potentially dangerous product, as long as you provided informed consent, okay? Mm -hmm. But if the product's risks outweighed the benefits, no warning can save you from product liability. All right. I said, what's a more perfect candidate than cigarettes as a product? Right, because there's no benefit. Exactly. So I sold them on it. 
we had a firm meeting. I think that was probably, I don't know, six year lawyer there, one year as a partner. And uh, we had a firm meeting and all the, I explained it to all the other partners and they all said, well, Mark, maybe this, we can't foot the bill on all this ourselves. So I put together a consortium of three firms, our firm and two other firms. And th that sold them. And, um, and the idea my... was that they would split the costs in proceeding with the litigation and exactly. the recovery if there was one. And every, every firm would have their own cases, individual cases, but as a, co a combined effort, we would conduct discovery and you know share costs of that. All right. And as it turned out, Chip alone was, a, was the discovery vehicle for all the other cases that were being handled by this mm -hmm. consortium. Right. And um, one of my partners was very good friends with an oncologist. And uh, over dinner, apparently he was discussing this with the oncologist and he said, I got a perfect candidate for you, Rose Chipolone. You'll love her. She had lung cancer, but you'll love her. We went out to Ro Fort Lee, uh, Fort, not Fort Lee, Little Ferry, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And a very modest but nice kept home. I meet Rose Chip alone, a very s small person in, in size and stature, but in terms of uh, being a tough character and being smart, Rose was both. She was she was the boss, and everybody knew it. Her husband Tony, still with a substantial old world Italian accent. He was a, a, an art, artisan, artist. He would create, he created uh, cables, steel cables used in a variety of uh, applications, including bridges and things like that, which were all handmade by him. And he was, he did fairly well, but, and then Rose and I spoke and you know, I guess I was young and I was a little feisty. And she was definitely feisty. And um, the first meeting didn't go perfectly. Why? What happened? I think, you know, I, I was pushing the wrong buttons and she was pushing the wrong buttons. Partly just the way we were both being very frank with each other. Uh -huh. And um, I called her up the next day and I said, look, Rose, you know, if I offended you in any way, let me know. If you don't think we can work together, let me know. And she said, no, Mark, it was just, it was the day. It was the monumental commitment that you described to me that I would have to make in terms of her time and living, trying to survive and still channeling a lot of her life's energy into a case that she may not even get to see to come to fruition. And once we understood each other, you know, because I, I presented it sort of bleakly for her, you know, explaining, look, Rose, you know, probably you're not going to get much better based upon what I've seen. And, you know, this is going to be a big commitment and you have to decide whether you want to spend the rest of whatever you have in this life fighting this, this monumental battle. And after we got that out of the way, Rose and I became fast friends actually. And um, I spent a lot of time with Rose and Tony. I, I watched her die. I was in her, her hospital room many, many days and many, many nights. And we became very, very close. Now, tell, tell me a little bit about her as a person. How old was she and when, what was her history with smoking? Okay. Rose was uh, I think she was in her mid fifties when she was first diagnosed with lung cancer. And um, she grew up in, you know, a cold, with a cold flat in, uh, in uh, Manhattan somewhere, not Manhattan, probably one of the, I don't remember whether it was Brooklyn or whatever it was, but she had a, a tough life and she was a, a tough lady. Um, she recounted how she started smoking as a teen, young teenager. They used to sell cigarettes back in those days. 
you could buy individual cigarettes. So you get to go in the store and buy individual cigarettes. And she thought it was glamorous because it was portrayed that way in movies and in advertising. And she bought into the whole thing. And that's when she started. And you know, that was that was it. And she was diagnosed with lung cancer by the time you knew her, obviously. Yes. That's and, that was how I got to meet her through the, her oncologist. And what was your I don't know if this is the right word, your vision for what this litigation would entail. What did you tell her she might be expected to be involved in? Uh, I went through the deposition process and I went through the investigative process that she should anticipate, which would include her relatives and friends. And my, my I was spot on in that forecast. And, uh, you know, I just, you're gonna be an open book, Rose. They're gonna, they're gonna keep picking and picking and picking until they find some place to go. That's gonna hurt your case, and it's gonna take a lot of strength. You're gonna get heat from your neighbors, your friends, your family, because they're gonna be interviewed, and then you're gonna have to withstand depositions. And you know they may try to be nice to you, and they may, some of them may try to be tough with you. She, she, she was terrific. She was a, a very likable, feisty person. Ready and, for the fight. And once she made that commitment, there was no, no distracting her from it. No matter how sick she was, she did her best to make sure she was still committing productively to the case. All right. So tell us about the case. You filed suit. How did it go? What happened? Well, before I filed suit, I mean, I wanted to find out what the history of this was. Um, and. I went back to, we went down to the Library of Congress and we got a full copy of the entire Surgeon General's, original, original Surgeon General's Committee on Smoking and Health, which included submissions by the various companies as well as other independent um, research. And it gave me an insight into, you know, if you're reading between the lines and stuff, and uh, I read everything I could find about people who had thought about it, done it, and um, try to figure out where it was that everybody went wrong. And uh, well, once I figured that out, um, I started, I just went full tilt in terms of discovery and um, just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and running into walls, but running through walls at times. Uh, and the tobacco companies all always fought all of these cases to the absolute hilt. Am I correct? To the death, yes. Yeah. Was, what was that like? That was, um, you know, it was, it was amazing because the, the legal theory was very sound. You know, and a lot of a lot of the states, if you look at the restatement of torts, comment I, it says, well, good cigarettes that cause cancer can't be can't be considered to be defective because I'm gonna have to turn this off for you. Um, just because they kill people. And um, the tobacco industry had a uh, a hand in that in that also. And they you know, I went through all the legislation, putting the warnings on packs of cigarettes. And you, you meet a, a lot of interesting people who were anti-smoking people, some of them zealots, some of them more health conscious uh, people, and more, more societal, but not zealots about it. And um, you realize that they were masters at it. Anytime they got a little heat, first time was the, when, I think his name was Banzaf, he, the, we had this, um, I can't remember what the doctrine was, but if, if one political side had time on TV to express their, the way they felt, mm -hmm. then somebody with an opposing view may not have equal time, but they were given time to respond. And he used that as a vehicle to respond to the tobacco industry's advertising. Very creative guy. Mm -hmm. And cigarette sales went 
went down, which evidenced the fact that, hey, you get a lot of information out there telling people how bad it is, it's not going to help us. And the more they advertised, they had, you know, they were, at, they were competing for a certain market among themselves. And no one was going to voluntarily give up. None of the companies would voluntarily give up their segment of the, of the market or give another company an advantage by not advertising. So they went to Congress and they got asked for a special dispensation for antitrust behavior. And they got together and they politically pushed through the Surgeon General's warning as opposed to their warning. All right, and let's let's talk about that. First of all, what was your legal theory in the litigation? How would you, in a lay person's kind of phrase, what your claim against Liggett? Okay, uh, well, Liggett, we we had several claims against Liggett and 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 others. Um, Liggett's was breach of warranty, so some, as simple and as archaic as that. Uh, they advertised their cigarettes as, you know, not being harmful, basically. And um, they were, they knew, and we, as we found out later, uh, they had plenty of research which evidenced the fact that they knew full well how dangerous the product was. And in fact, they had developed what they considered to be a safer cigarette. And they didn't market it only because, in the testimony of the chief executive officer, they were told, I was told, that Philip Mars threatened to crush them if they ever marketed that product. All right. And what uh, were the two, what was Liggett's defenses or what were their defenses? You know, they, basically they have defended these cases on one basis only. Everybody knew cigarette smoking was harmful or, or thought it was harmful. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, are you kidding me now? And when you look at it in 1988, when I tried the case, you know, it was a viable argument. You know, people's knowledge of the hazards of the smoking was substantially greater than back in the, in the, in the 50s and the 40s. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, that was the hardest part is to change the mindset of the jury. jury. We're not look I, when I, so when I tried the case, I was I explained to them clearly, I'm, I'm not talking about today's information. I'm talking about what was available when people were smoking like roast chip alone back in the 40s and 50s. And um, that, that helps. And I tried to flip the, you know, the blame uh, onto the tobacco companies and said there was nobody more fully aware of the hazards than the tobacco industry. Why didn't they disclose it? Yeah, and uh, talk. you did some discovery or a lot of discovery, found hundreds of thousands of documents. What did the tobacco companies know and when did they know it? They knew it from some of the, they knew it back in the early 50s, early 40s, uh, late 40s, okay? And um, the gentleman's name, Dr. Winder, he had some clinical studies that he had done, which are not, it's not epidemiological. In other words, he saw that there, there was a higher incidence in his practice of people who had lung cancer who were smokers. And then he tried to do some work on that. And there was another guy from one of the VA hospitals. He was doing it too. And uh, in the early 50s, they, they, they started publishing thing, articles uh, indicating that you know, this could really be a problem. The tobacco industry's response was, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna form the Tobacco Research Institute and we're going to put advertisements in every single newspaper throughout the country, which they did, basically saying, we take our responsibilities seriously, and we're going to spend millions of dollars every year to determine whether our products really cause these diseases that people claim. And they've, they have funded hundreds of billions of dollars worth of research, 
but not research to determine whether their product really causes cancer. They, they conducted abstract research on cancer. Um, they, through their political clout, they, they got the AMA, the head of the, the editor of the American Medical Association's journal, they co-opt them, and he became a consultant for them after he left the, his position with JAMA. And he would write editorials saying it hasn't been shown. It was a pretty interesting process. All right, so but, um, yeah, go on. But you know, there was there was there were there was there were research done. There was research done by them internally, not so far back as the early '40s. But yeah, I mean, it you you saw it as it developed. And the research that they funded was not intended to determine whether cigarette smoking, but more basic science research. But it looked really good, you know, from a public relations perspective. We're spending hundreds of million dollars, hundreds of million dollars, professors at Harvard and Yale and this place and that place. And um, they all, all those studies have not implicated cigarettes as a cause of cancer because that wasn't the topic interesting were there any settlement discussions or was it always going to be scorched earth litigation to the death well there was one point and i'm not going to give you the name of the person but it, it, it litigation of this nature it's all consuming for both sides no matter how many lawyers they put on it, there's only a certain number of lawyers that can have the kind of knowledge, everyday knowledge of the litigation, how it's really going. And um, uh, there was a lawyer who I had developed a, a good working relationship with. And we sort of had a, a wink and a nod relationship. So he would look like a hero if I told him I'm gonna be filing a motion for X within the next week and he would give me something for that mm -hmm. it was sort of like that sort of synergy and we became professionally friendly as a matter of fact i made a, a lot of professional friends that ended up being friends in very heated litigation you know you, 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 you lock horns for four three four years uh, you get to know the other person and if as long as they're honest Somebody can be as zealous as they want in defending anybody. That's the way our judicial system works. And it's a great judicial system. Um, when people are being dishonest, that's when things go wrong. Right. And uh, at one point in time, there was a, um, a discussion uh, between he and I about it. And uh, he actually recommended it at some juncture. And everybody laughed at him, of course. But was, oh, he recommended it to their side, to the Tibetan. Yeah. I said, I said, you know, Steve. Uh, well, there I'm going to say his name. I don't want to say his name. But, oh, but he 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 wanted. He said, look, you know, we said, why are you guys taking a chance on all this? That's that was my my discussion. I said it's crazy. I said when I started this litigation, I had virtually only public documents. Now I have a room that's maybe a hundred feet by a hundred feet. It's a pretty big room with nothing but shelves filled with industry documents. And we have researchers who worked for different companies who said, yeah, we knew that cigarette smoking causes cancer, and, but we weren't allowed to publish anything about it. And I said, that's not good. One of these days, you guys are going to get clobbered. And this is the first time anybody has really gotten to you guys in terms of discovery. No one has ever gotten any documents from you. And eventually, when, the, when, the, when people in society become normalized, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and a jury verdict in favor of the tobacco industry is not going to be such a 
a traumatic thing for the jurors. I mean, oh yeah. the concept, even if they think it's right, as the post-jury interview, the post-trial interviews showed, I, I'm not allowed in Jersey to interview the jurors. Right. Uh, but um, uh, one of the reporters, I think Amy Singer, she she interviewed all of them, all the jurors, and it was interesting. You know, some of the jurors wanted to award multi-million dollars to to Rose and to Tony. And others were like hysterical because they said they were crying because they they got swept along and they were they even agreed to vote in favor of a verdict. So there was a there was a big schism that that, that existed. But you know, after that first verdict, I, I knew that it would be uh, highly likely that there would be some really big verdict down the line or some resolution as it ended up being. Mm -hmm. so, but the settlement talks went nowhere. No, and he and I have laughed about it over the years. Yeah, and so you went to trial. How did, how did, first of all, how was jury selection? And then what was the trial? Jury selection was uh, interesting. Um, the industry, of course, hired experts, and it's not your typical experts because there were so many. There were so many potential jurors that would have bias one way or the other. That Judge Sarek in the federal district court, who handled the case, uh, had um, us agree upon a questionnaire that would be forwarded to prospective jurors uh, over a period of months to try to get a you know, some kind of uh, potential jury pool that would look like any other, it would be like any other case. Um, and the industry came up with a, a, a questionnaire that was clearly geared to using, you know, computers that they would analyze all the information. So what we injected is a lot of objective, I mean, subjective questions, mm -hmm. much less, uh, much less easy to use in a computer at the time software program, and it was it was it, it was hard. It was long before we hammered it all out, um, and then we started. You know, we got that jury pool, and we started uh, voir dire. And in New Jersey, the judge does the voir dire, mm -hmm. uh, depending upon. And voir dire is asking questions of the other prospective jurors, uh, trying to elicit information that might to, first to generally tell us who they are and otherwise to indicate that they might have some sort of bias one way or the other. And um, it's, uh, it, you can't try your case like you can in certain jurisdictions and in, in, in jury selection, but right. it was, uh, it was it was an interesting process. It was a long process, and um, you remember how long it took? Uh, uh, it took days and days. Uh -huh. you know, uh, it was it was a long process. And did you have smokers, non-smokers, former smokers? We had we had two smokers. Um, I think two or yeah, two two smokers. I think pretty much everybody was a former smoker. Maybe one or two weren't. Yeah. Uh, and a wide gap in their education, their age, and their socioeconomic position. Yeah. Uh, so it was a it was a real, I I said uncohesive uh, group of people. It was right. it was interesting. We should note just for a moment here, in those days, how prevalent smoking was everywhere. There was smoking in restaurants, there was smoking in theaters, there was smoking on airplanes. For the younger people today who have grown up where you can only basically smoke in your home or outdoors, be aware that when uh, Mark mentions that all of these jurors were either smokers or former smokers, everybody smoked everywhere at all times. I was a former smoker. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, I, I and I, I tell you, uh, I didn't, when I started, I didn't have the information that I did about how egregious some of the behavior was. 
Yeah. But I, I was, I just wanted people to, I'm not, I wasn't an abolitionist, if you will. I was trying to just make sure that everybody was fully informed and they weren't overwhelmed by information that was contrary to, to undermine basically whatever warning that's on there. And you, your, your observation about at earlier points in our, in, 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 the, in this country's development, cigarette smoking was as prevalent as almost drinking. Um, and what's interesting, because one, one aspect of our case had to do with addiction and um, nicotine receptors in the brain and all sorts of sophisticated stuff. But one study that I read, totally unrelated to tobacco, was related to heroin. And it talked about Vietnam vets and their use of heroin in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and how difficult it was to quit there because it was an accepted behavior, maybe not by those higher up in the military, but to those that, that you're sharing the ground with, it was, it was acceptable, but they got home and heroin, the use of heroin is no longer acceptable when they got back to wherever they lived. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, former users who were able to break their habit, their heroin addiction, because it wasn't socially acceptable. Just that social acceptability alone has such an impact on people's ability to stop using a product that's potentially harmful to them. Interesting. Yeah. So tell us about the trial. The trial, okay, um, big picture. Um, a lot of lawyers, uh, and the, the tobacco companies hired some very good lawyers and some of the largest firms in, in the United States, uh, Shook Hardy and Bacon, um, Shook Hardy and Bacon, yeah, they were the tobacco industry's lawyers forever. And, um, they, they were in Kansas city, Missouri, and wouldn't think that that would be the place they would choose, uh, and, but they they succeeded in avoiding any serious threat for, for decades and decades and decades. Um, so they they were a, a big player and they knew a lot about the history. Um, and there's some very good lawyers there, mm -hmm. Jones Day, and Covington and Burling. You know, you, know, was, you name the firm, they were involved. Arnold and who was Porter. sitting at your side of the courtroom? And on my side of the courtroom, as it ended up, the consortium sort of that I described to the three firms sort of disappeared. Um, and I ended up going to one of the firms, leaving the firm that I was at, going to one of the firms that was another member. So we lost my former firm. And uh, one of the other firms got conflicted out almost. And it, uh, it was really, it, it, I viewed it as my, my, my baby. Mm -hmm. Not that I wouldn't share caring of my baby with anybody, but I wasn't going to let this baby die. Right. I was going to nurture it until it matured, and that was my job. Good. How long did the trial last? The trial, uh, as incredible as it may sound for a civil case, was four and a half months. Um, every day, um, my daily routine, I basically, I, I worked with one paralegal, um, an associate from my, my, my firm and, um, every once in a while, somebody else would pitch in. That's all we had. So I would get up at four o'clock in the morning, prepare for court, drive to Newark try the case, you know, go, go, go home, have something to eat, maybe to run on the treadmill for an hour, 45 minutes. And then I'd spend probably like 11 o'clock. Um, I would spend the rest of the evening deciding on what I needed for the next day. I would prepare that a list of the documents 
and I had gone through every document myself. So I had a list of everything that I wanted and I had mm -hmm. described it and numbered it and all that sort of stuff. And I would call my paralegal, Nelson, and um, Nelson there, who subsequently went to law school and is doing very well. He's a great guy. Um, Nelson would uh, then pull the documents and have them to my house by around three o'clock. And then I'd take the documents at four o'clock, review them, figure out how I was gonna use it. And then that every day was the same. And it was, uh, it was an incredible experience. It's amazing what the human body can do. Yeah. At some point prior to the trial, Rose passed away. Yes. What happened? Uh, she took she took a, a turn a real turn for the worse at one point and I can't remember what year it was. Um, or I think. Okay. Um, they had taken her completed her deposition, and in retrospect, I should have done a de bene essay deposition. I didn't do it. I right? I don't know whether it was because I liked her too much and it would be saying too much about what her future would be. Mm -hmm. um, Tell but us what that kind of deposition is, just for the... De bene essay is when you're preserving testimony of a witness because they're they not going to be there. there at the time of trial, whether it's because they're dying or whether it's somebody who's leaving the country, whatever it is. Like, if they're not going to be available, you preserve their testimony and that would be offered by certainly a videotape deposition. Right. And that, but, was, but my, that was my error. I'm not sure it was an error. Okay. Um, and then what happened to the case after her, her death? Um, her husband, Tony, who's a, just a mild mannered, really good guy. I mean, not, not, none of the, none of the, none of the characteristics that rose, she, he was not aggressive or not, a, not a fighter per se. Um, not feisty like Rose. He was just sort of a, just a good guy, a good human being, a very likable guy. And Tony, he was there every day for court. And um, he can't, can't say that he, he fully understood everything that was going on, but he tried and he always wanted to be helpful. And uh, his testimony was, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Let's put it that way. Yeah. What were the closing arguments like? Well, closing arguments, <laughs> that was, that, that's an interesting subject. Um, closing arguments uh, were scheduled on June, whatever, in 1980, I think it was June, beginning of June. Um, and I was handling, I handled the trial pretty much myself. Originally, somebody was gonna take care of the addiction issue, and, Somebody was going to do this, but I ended up taking care of everything except for the, what I call the micro causation. What I mean by that is I would take care of convincing the jury that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer, but we had to show that cigarette smoking was a cause of Rose's cancer. And, you know, I didn't think that that was a, a heavy lift based upon the information that I had. And uh, my associate was going to do that. And, and just the, the level of proof is that you need to prove it is that more probably than not, that's her correct. smoking was a substantial factor in causing the cancer that killed her. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And so the associate, that's the associate's job. That was her job. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, maybe it was because, you know, every television news organization was there and every magazine was there and every every important newspaper was there. There was standing room only uh, for most of the trial, certainly the end of it. Um, I guess she just couldn't get it together. And not that she was a bad lawyer, she's a good lawyer. But, you know, for a four or five year old, five, four or five year lawyer, it's a, it's a lot of responsibility. It's a very intimidating environment. Mm -hmm. You know, the courtroom looked much like what's behind me right here, um, but even more dramatic, the, the old federal courthouse, heavy drapes, I mean, really very imposing. 
And um, I decided that I had to, to handle that, that part of it in my closing. And I wasn't prepared to for that. Uh, the evening before I'm supposed to do my closing, I called the judge. And I called my adversaries and said, tomorrow I'm going to ask the, the judge to permit me to uh, d an extra day to prepare for closing arguments. And we went into the judge's chambers early that morning. And um, there was no, no, nobody on the other side wanted to give me any more time. No. Uh, and that, which is fair. I mean, it's, that's our obligation. Um, uh, the judge sort of cut the baby in half. Uh, they gave, he gave them some rebuttal time, which they don't have uh, in, in New Jersey and, and federal courts. Um, and so it worked out. And I, I, I basically said, Judge, I have a lot of respect for you. And I have a lot of respect for my adversaries. I wouldn't be asking for this. They all know me well. I've been prepared for everything, for every event, whether it's, it was a deposition or whatever. I can't jeopardize this case because I'm not ready for this. Mm -hmm. I said, if I if you fall, hold me in contempt, I wouldn't hold it against you. And I'll prepare for my summation and trial in, 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 uh, in jail. In jail. You know, it's, I, I'm a big boy. I can handle that. And uh, he sort of smiled. And uh, that was it. So summation was the following day. And, um, and what were your themes in your closing argument, in your summation? Well, I mean, I was, it was big picture. I mean, I, I had claims against the, even though they were eviscerated to a great extent by, by the Third Circuit, and I lost my risk utility claim. Uh, the tobacco industry had funded the uh, pharmaceutical effort, pharmaceutical companies to um get through the this new jersey uh, legislature um a bill that changed product liability law during the pendency of this case that adopted did away with risk utility and i was facing you know comment i the restatement that good tobacco is not bad just because it kills you but that was the whole theory exactly. of your case to begin with this exactly. exactly now it's gone yes yes so, so what i mean was left what was your argument i mean i i mean i had evidence that that they they jointly with they acted in concert in creating this tobacco research entity and the tobacco institute to undermine the effectiveness of the cigarette smoke you know the surgeon general's warning on cigarette smoking and um you know the fact that the head of research of Liggett, Ma uh, Liggett Meyer said that they came up with a, a safer cigarette and then when they wanted to market it they both he and I believe that the CEO of the company said that because I said well why didn't you market it you could have made a fortune people could smoke and they wouldn't get lung cancer mm -hmm. we were told that Philip Morris would destroy us um so i mean there was a there were big pictures you know there was the advertising and misleading and not only did it not have a warning but it painted it as a glamorous sort of thing and there mm -hmm. were a lot of health indirect health claims no cough not a cough in a car load you know things like subtle things like that right um and you know the the warranty issues. So we got into the advertising and how, again, this goes back to social acceptability, uh, how it permeated our, our our society, and how every movie star smoked and doctors smoked. Well, there were ads with doctors talking yeah. about mild yeah. smokes. Yeah, and uh, so it was it was big picture. It wasn't just you know breach of warranty. And I wanted to preserve the record just, just for appeal. Right. And uh, what was there? We still hadn't gotten to the Supreme Court of the United States right. on the uh, preemption issue. Although you were heading that way. I tried once during the pendency of the case, and they re they rejected our writ ah. uh, before trial. I think it was in 1986 we petitioned them. 
Um, and they rejected it. They rejected it. And uh, they wanted, you know, some, some of it is, let's see how it comes up through the district courts and the, the yeah. circuit courts. And if there's a division, then it's not easy to get cert granted. No, no, no. Uh, certainly not in a products liability case. No. It's, it's way out of their, their bailiwick. Yeah. Um, um, what was the defense summation, basically? The defense summation was she knew, like everybody else, and she got sick, and now she wants money for it. All right. And, and then the jury gets the case. What happened? The jury, the jury. well, the, the, the summations were, my summation was, I remember it being like three hours. It was some recounted as being longer. And uh, I've taught trial practice at Rutgers. I think I taught it for six years. And, you know, people always say, well, after a half an hour, the jury shuts down. And my experience is if you keep informing them of information that's pertinent in a way that's understandable and meaningful, they'll pay attention as long as, as anybody. Mm -hmm. Make it, but you have to use different media. So I would use a videotape deposition of this and then show them blow up of documents, physical blow ups of documents, and then read a little bit, you know, then you know, the whole thing. So, I mean, it was a day of just closings. And I think they deliberated for maybe a, almost a week. And that's uh, the longest time known to humanity while the jury is out deliberating. I, like I said, I could try the four, four and a half months. I mean, uh, there was one time we had a long weekend and I took one day off and all that adrenaline just evaporated. It took me about a week to get that level of adrenaline back in my body so that I could walk through walls again. Yeah. But <clears throat> once I lose control like that, you know, it's out of my hands. There's nothing more I can do. It is the worst part about trying cases, yeah. Yeah. just waiting for the verdict. Right. I mean, the days are so long. Right. And then there's a knock on the door. The jury has a verdict. What happened? Well, um, I can't say I was totally happy, but I wasn't totally sad. Um, uh, it was the first successful verdict, jury verdict. And, um, you know, I thought that the jury missed the point on a couple of things, or maybe they weren't ready to accept it. That's that's what the post uh, uh, trial interviews of the jurors sort of sort of evidenced. And um, uh, we we were happy just to have put that first substantial dent in the armor of the industry, letting everybody know that this can be done. And this is this is being done on the first real good decent shot at, at the jury. I, I'm sorry, at the industry. And the verdict, yeah. I think, was for four hundred thousand dollars after they found that Rose was mostly at fault. Well, the jury, the juror, the the judge's charge was wrong on that, on that issue. In comparative fault, right? Um, he was he was just it, it, comparative fault doesn't apply in, in breach of warranty. Mm -hmm. Period. Right. But that's beside the point. Um, he got most of the case right, but he didn't get that right. But, you know, who's going to try it again? After we went to the Supreme Court, uh, two years later, we ended up in the Supreme Court. All right. And then what happened there? Um, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting court to be in. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been in the Supreme Court. No, no. It's a big semicircle you know, like Crescent, and you can get a question from your, from your, from the extreme right, and you don't, and you're already talking to the extreme left, you don't mm -hmm. know which justice it is, and you better have their names down. Right. Especially Chief Justice Rehnquist. If you call him Justice Rehnquist, if yeah. you did, you were beaten, beaten up really badly. So I went down there the, uh, the term before, our, our case was, was listed, ours was listed in October, I believe in whatever it was. Um, so I went down and I sat there for a week 
And if you're a member of the bar, the Supreme Court bar, you can actually go right behind the lawyers that are arguing instead of being out there you know, in, in more of a, as more of a visitor. Right. And it became a courtroom. And um, it, was, it was an interesting type of experience. We had, I had a lot of uh, help from a lot of different sources. We must have had various different governmental agencies, very different states, different um, uh, medical associations that submitted what we call, you know, friends of the court brief. Right. And um, they, they, they helped polish everything I did. And, um, you know, it, it was an interesting experience. And then ultimately, appeals, the Supreme Court, up and down, jury verdict, the case finally ultimately settled, didn't it? it well, not exactly. I mean, we, it, I argued it the first time, um, and they only had eight justices. Uh, I think Thomas had not been confirmed at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, they ordered re-argument. Yeah. And um, when they ordered re-argument, I, I contacted Larry Tribe, who at Harvard, he's a constitutional law expert. And he, he, he wanted to argue it the first time. And I said, look, Larry, I'm sure you could do a better job than me. I said, but you know what? I've argued in a lot of different courts, appeals courts. I think I can handle this, maybe not perfectly, but I don't think the difference is gonna be substantial. And when they ordered re-argument, I was satisfied I did my best. And if it's that close, you know, if everybody perceived there was a split, why else would, you know, four and four, mm -hmm. uh, why else would you order re-argument? You need a tiebreaker. You need a tiebreaker. And he argued it, and I would have done it differently. And um, it, we ended up with a lot less than I thought we would get. So, yeah. But right. you know, I'm I'm not going to ascribe that, all of that to Larry. I mean, you know, it's it's um, they had. I mean, it was evident that that I mean, certainly Blackman, who wrote the opinion, he had no idea what product liability was like. Yeah, I mean, he just didn't, and it was, it was. He asked me a question, and I said, "In New Jersey, it's not like that, Judge. It's not how product liability law well works." He says, "Well, in another state," I said, "There's no state in 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 the United States of America where product liability would end up with that result." Right. And then, um, Scalia, I could hear Scalia saying. Mr. Udell, we're not talking about any of the United States. We're talking about Justice Blackman's state. He was giving me a little kick. Uh, oh boy! Yeah. So it, it, it was a very it was a very interesting experience. And for well, ours, the whole case was interesting because this was history. This was the first time that the monolith of the tobacco companies had a crack in it. The yep. first time they lost, and ultimately this led, I guess, directly or indirectly, I don't really know to the master settlement agreement with all of the states. Uh, it, it did. I mean, it, there was there was an interim step that occurred. After our, after the, the dust sort of settled, I got a phone call from uh, Roberta Walburn, who was a partner at uh, Mike Cerisi's firm. <clears throat> uh, and she said they were interested in filing a claim on behalf of the state and, um, and Blue Cross Blue Shield for compensation for all of the cigarette related diseases they pay out money for. Mm -hmm. And they poured through what, what, everything that I had. And they were really excited about it. And I spent a lot of time with them on it. And they were the ones that came up with the idea of the, the governmental issue. Right. And um, the, I think the attorney general was Her, uh, Herbert, Herbert Humphrey III. Um, and uh, he was the attorney general who had authorized them to sue on behalf of the state. And that was the, 
that was the that ended up being the model for other states and then finally they had the master settlement agreement but it was all it was it was what we came up with in discovery uh, that really facilitated there was no other great revelations and uh i walked into that room i described before you know 100 by 100 yeah when i first walked into that room there was not there was it wasn't even a full shelf shelf you know set yeah. of shelves that was filled when i finished the room was stuffed with documents and we didn't have scanning and all that stuff at that time right but so it was, it was a years long effort and it must have been grueling for you was it worth it absolutely absolutely it is professionally i mean i've handled a lot of cases and they're very some of them have been very rewarding in many ways uh both to my clients to myself but this was this was this was this was the most important case to me um and i was going to try to change what i thought was something that was wrong and i wasn't going to stop until i did it and uh as a as a after after that the chip alone case i i was peter angelos who owns the baltimore orioles mm -hmm. He was going to represent the state of Maryland, but he wanted didn't have any experience in tobacco litigation, so he asked me to join him. So I ended up representing the state of Maryland and um, with him, and uh, you know was, that was part of the whole big settlement thing. Yeah, but it was you know I I I hope I believe in my heart that I made a difference, and that's important. It should be important to every lawyer whatever on whatever level you can we have a, the best judicial system in the world and it's got its imperfections and some of them have become more profound over the years but it's it's the great equalizer and ladies and gentlemen mark edell thank you Ray. thank you